sign-in sheet over there for those of you who need credit for 298. Well, this is fun. I think the director is hanging out. There we go. I didn't actually prepare anything to give this introduction because I know everything that I need to know. Um, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with Diana in some way. Many of you are probably familiar with her in different ways than I am. Um, but it's, uh, it's fun to, to introduce her for today's talk. So if you don't know, Diana is a gaucho. She's UC Santa Barbara. Came over to Moss Landing in the late 80s, um, right before we became the trailer trash generation, so right before the earthquake. Um, and obviously was here at Moss Landing. She was a beer pig, one of Mike Foster's students. Um, did a lot of work here, made a lot of connections. Didn't want to leave. Ended up graduating, moving how far away? Hopkins. Hopkins, and then Santa Cruz, then Davenport. I mean, literally, you haven't you you haven't moved more than 35 miles since you. <laughs> Squatted down in, in Moss, ended up um, in the Ramundi Car Lab, spent an enormous amount of time um, in places not in Monterey Bay doing fun things with uh, fun critters, um, and got her PhD mostly working on, on rotalists and, and groups in Baja, both on the west and east coasts of the peninsula. A lot of work in the kelp forests, got trained as an instructor, got trained uh, further on as a very good instructor got hired back here to um, launch the next generation of divers out of Moss Landing. Marine Lab has a national presence in terms of diving education and outreach, and the entire time spends her time with her family and others going around the planet doing really cool things. Um, along the way, she's gotten time to be teaching here at Moss Landing, the dive class, the Baja class, the subtitle ecology class with Scott, myself, and other colleagues working in a bunch of different systems, ended up being part of the Secretariat with Scott and I, I forget when we did it, but it was three long years, um, and has had a really strong role in, in the Western Society of Naturalists. And then last year was awarded the Western Society Naturalists, Naturalist of the Year in the large meeting in Ensenada with a whole bunch of totally sober people in the audience <laughs> who heard this talk. And so we are lucky that we get to see Diana's version of just things that are cool in what we do. And so we just want to welcome you. Thanks, Diana. Thank you. Mike. <laughs> Mike just gave Lynn half my talk and my intro. So this is perfect. <laughs> now I can say okay. Thank you for coming today. This talk is about natural history and what um, basically I, my philosophy or my views on making observations and melding that with science. And a lot of that has come from Moss Landing. This is an amazing place um, and fundamental to my work and my outlook on life. And I'm gonna talk about some of the people that have influenced me. And it was also a deep honor to get the award at WSN this year. So um, I came up with a title, and this is altered slightly, but um, it was tailored towards talking about field immersion and how curiosity, natural history, and collaboration le led to discoveries in California. So um, I am a now instructor, so I'm gonna talk about, uh, first of all, thanking you guys for being here, but also sharing a poem with you that tries to articulate um, about my view on taking time to see. And it's a poem by Georgia O'Keeffe when someone asks her why she paints flowers. And it's nobody sees a flower really, it's so small. It takes time, we haven't time. And to see takes time like to have friends takes time. And um, for me, I spend a lot of time underwater. And it is now, with as more and more technology has come into our life, it, it is the time that being submerged is a, kind of an emblem for me because it's really one of the only times I get to sit down and think for about as long as a tank tanks, takes. So, but this is kind of one of my first visual aids because as a NAWI instructor, you're supposed to get an attention getting step. And so, I didn't take my phone. And it, I was supposed to be a bigger beaker, but they were locked up in the camo <laughs> lab. And so, I, this is an analogy for really taking the time to look around and see. You don't have to do that, um, but I am going to. Okay, uh, this was uh, the Western Society of Naturalists for those of you, because we are a lab of oceanographers and scientists and ecologists and a whole group, but the Western Society of Naturalists is a group over 100 years old 
that really highlighted um, terrestrial and marine science uh, along the west coast. And Paul Dayton, pictured here in the Antarctic in a wetsuit, um, in the lower right-hand corner, and then underwater with large sponges, he embodied that history of exploration and rigorous science and exploring both the um, terrestrial and marine worlds, and both conducting science, exploring, and also taking students and teaching courses that inspired people. So it is my intention today to share that, um, his viewpoints, and he also started this award in 1999 to highlight different naturalists of the year, and so I feel very honored um, to be part of that pathway. We as naturalists stand on the shoulders of the people that came before us that were literally surviving off of knowing where things were, what seasons they came in. And um, the Native Americans that lived along our coast, these is a depiction from Captain Cook's a description of California natives in um, 1712, common birds and fish that they might be um, catching. And then this is a photo by Leon de Gay, um, who I'll talk about later, of California natives. And the early naturalists that came learned from these people and um, their understanding, again, of seasons, ethnobotany, and when things came and uh, uh, passed through time. I'm going to start by talking just a few, about a few natural historians and scientists um, along the Californias and show people like Joseph Grinnell, who was um, one of the early naturalists and who had a big impact on uh, both natural history and science. He was an early field biologist, and one of his um, contributions was taking very precise field notes. And he worked all over California. He was a vertebrate ecologist, and he was the first director of vertebrate ecology at UC Berkeley, but he also taught at the Seaside Lab. He taught embryology at Hopkins Marine Station, which was then called the Seaside Lab in Hopkins. So he was a broad ecologist, and, or a broad biologist, and he really, um, sought patterns and defined them. This continued further south with um, two biologists, Nelson and Goldman, and these two biologists, um, see that's usually, see you need my beaker. <laughs> um, these two biologists spent 14 years, some of them, around Baja California and in mainland Mexico describing the vertebrates. And they collected all sorts of species, de defined and described a number of new ones. Their uh, collections still are in the Smithsonian and in the Natural History Museum in San Diego. And there's an excellent documentary, even the first five minutes, which is on YouTube called Devil's Road, is about their adventure down into the Bujums. That's why I have this picture of them, which I'll talk about also. Famous tree that many of the Baja class has seen. So in the Gulf of California, because that's one of the focuses that I'm um, pointing out in this talk, some of the early naturalists were people that were broadly trained. And Leon de Gay was an engineer. He came over from France, and he worked in the Bolero mines, the silver mines in Mulahe. But he spent his off time exploring all the endemic species on the islands offshore. He made the first, he described this feral cactus de Gettii on Catalina Island in the Gulf, which is an amazing, they grew up to 14, or not 14 meters, but probably three to four meter feral cactuses. But importantly to this talk, he made original collections of corallins, and they are in the Museum of Natural History in Paris. He collected them because they were associated with the aquaculture um, uh, facilities there, because they were using pearl oyster, them as um, substrate, so this, is our history in aquaculture here at the lab. It goes reaches far back, but the pearl oysters uh, came out of um, so they came out of swimming by concentrating onto these corallins that he collected. This is also an important figure, um, E. L. Dawson, who um, was he described many. He was a phycologist, and he described many of the co uh, West Coast species, both along California, but also in the Gulf of California in the 50s and 60s. And he was the director of both the Natural History Museum in San Diego, but also the Baudet Foundation that Moss Lenning has strong ties to. So those were some of the further, uh, the past. In the more recent past, there have been many other explorers in the Gulf and along California, and I'm only talking about a few. This is Ed Ricketts, 
which um, the boat before the Sheila B was named the Ricketts, and it was named after him. Sure, I'm sure many of you know about his uh, Log of the Sea of Cortez, written by John Steinbeck. But, and this is a map of the places that they stopped. And, but there are many other naturalists working in different fields. He was an invertebrate zoologist, but David Starr Jordan describing fish species along the coast, um, to name a few. And they, the, all of these works have been compiled into these historic um, books. And so it uh, defines some of our historic knowledge on invertebrates, fish, marine algae, some looking, starting to look at uh, species interactions. The same in, happens in the Gulf. The common invertebrates and a new depiction, a new um, updated version of invertebrates. And then um, Jim Norris did an early description of algal species. So there's a historic body of knowledge. And that, uh, what I'm going to talk about from now forward is how these things influence me through immersion, natural history, and collaboration, and led to a body of work I'm going to describe. So my, I started out um, being immersed in the field. I had two parents from Ohio who came to California and were surrounded by naked geology because they were geologists and in the back east it's covered with plants. Out here we had access to mountains, deserts, oceans, and the exploration started early for me in psychology because we were studying nematocyst size in um, near cystis. But I was early exposed to the, to the ocean, and so being able to explore and then being comfortable underwater exploring is something I've tried to share with other people, um, including some of the people in this room. Some of the early people that influenced me in both natural history and um, science started out at UC Santa Barbara with field courses with Armin Curis and um, Breschmitt and Sally Holbrook, who uh, exposed us to exploring, but also with rigorous science. And I was luck fortunate enough to first uh, conduct research diving with Alice Aldridge, uh, depicted here. And she was really one of the founding people that looked at the flux of carbon in the up and upper ocean through uh, marine snow. And she showed, using this cubic quadrat to try to look at sinking rates, just exposing us as students to devising field tools to co uh, measure something new. You might not have the perfect tool, but you can create it. These other three people, John Pierce from UC Santa Cruz, um, Pete Ramondi from UC Santa Cruz as well, and then Mike Foster, all had, have had fundamental um, influences on going outside and looking around and understanding the natural history, but also combining that with rigorous science. And um, fostering science, if you want to call it that. Sometimes it was too much critique. That <laughs> would, <laughs> but if you could survive the technique, I thought that um, I would show this next picture because this really has uh, been the, one of the back, backbones of Moss Landing. And when we were in the psychology lab, this was the poster on the wall, which I actually have the original here. This is uh, Dave Scheel and he's holding a book, The Principles of Statistical and Experimental Design, is the title, by Weiner, which was our Bible back then. We were not only exposed to natural history, but also using statistical techniques that were up to date. And we have people here in this room with Gita and Mike Graham and uh, Scott Hamilton, who you come to when you have a question of what, how to look at data. And so this trend of really Rigorous science combined with observation um, still is here today in all the different labs. I'm just talking about the organismal lab. But really how to be scholarly. How, that was uh, really um, one of the fundamentals that we um, came away from our Moss Landing training. Mike mentioned Moss Landing. So Moss Landing is one of the unique places um, that I came to but because it sits at the head of a submarine canyon. And not all of us can submerge ourselves to go and see it, but if you get a chance, you really should, because it's one of the few places in the world that you can go offshore. We sit at the axis, so we have access to the axis of a submarine canyon. On the west coast of North America, there are five submarine canyons. 
Astoria is really deep and offshore, but we have La Jolla, Monterey, and then there are two at the tip of Cabo San Lucas. And this book by Francis Shepard and a following one by Shepard and Dill described the submarine canyons. And when I first came to Moss Landing, we were taking marine geology from Mike Ledbetter. Well, another part of geology is earthquakes. And so <laughs> six weeks into my career here, the lab was knocked down with us inside of it at the end of the day, which is another alarming story. But the upshot was us students, so I felt like maybe I should go somewhere else. There's no lab here. <laughs> <laughs> but really it's the people, the lab, it wasn't where the lab was, it was the people and the interactions between them that maintained that same philosophy towards science. And that's why many of us both stuck around and many other people once the lab was gone came here. And we've been supportive of field work and even though we didn't have a dive locker, we could still come up with a plan to go diving. And so some students and I decided to go and do what you should do at the end of uh, first semester is go on a boondoggle, go down to Baja. So we decided to drive to the tip of Baja and dive in all the submarine canyons. That was our loose dive plan. So um, one of our lab mates had taken Paul Dayton's uh, class where he took people out in the field down in the Gulf. And no, there was no Google Maps or anything. You just had the AAA map, the AAA guide, which shows by Concepcion, and then just start driving. And you really didn't even have radio, so you had to talk to your friends in the car. But that was our, that was our loose plan that we had approved by the dive leader here. <laughs> <laughs> and I try really hard to support that still to this day. You should go explore, because you never know what you're gonna find. So this is depicted here is the map that's in Francis Shepard and Dill's submarine canyons uh, of the world. And what you can see is this is Cabo San Lucas, and the, here, and then up here is Los Frailes. And in both of these canyons, just like at Scripps and Moss Landing, you can kick offshore or literally walk off the shore into the axis. So we, this is one of uh, Los Frailes, and you can see it's starting to drop off that uh, steeply right three or four meters offshore. That's a whole nother story, what we found there. What the real story is what we found on the way. So that's what I'm gonna tell you about. We were driving down Highway 1. Just like Highway 1 out here, it extends all the way to Baja. And there is a carbonate sand tombolo right off the road. And we drive out there, because it's at low tide, so it's exposed. We go diving, and this is my second visual aid. I'm gonna hand these around. You just take a couple of these and keep passing them. Here, I'll give you some of the big ones over here. Because people say, what are those? And then this is a cal sad Catalina one. I'll tell you about that, sorry. But we found these on the bottom. And we sat around the campfire, and then we put them on our dash. And then we had no radio and no uh, Google uh, music, so we watched them roll back and forth and go into, <laughs> into the vent. I was with Tom Oakey. We had <laughs> it was cosmic. Um, and so we found, we thought about what are these things. We, he had taken, the, one of the lab guys had taken um, marine botany with Mike Foster, so we knew they were non-geniculate, crustose, coral, and algal, algae. We drove back after going to Cabo, got our tanks filled in Mulahe, and we called the lab collect. Mike Foster answered his phone, and he, he, we said, well, do you know what these are? And he kind of had heard of them, but not really, so we sampled them, and um, the, my buddy had a thesis already, I came back and I've been working on them now for over 25 years. So the next part of the story is about the collaborations and the, some of the discoveries we've had on the way. So th this is probably one of the ones you're holding right there in that picture. Um, we found rotoliths. They're, they're free living coral and nodules. They form beds worldwide. They're complex and biodiverse. They fossilize, very few macroalgae fossilize. So these have been used as paleo indicators of shallow environments. They're on the they graced the cover of Journal of Phycology. Uh, Mike Graham is the editor. And um, they grow slowly and they're vulnerable to disturbance. Some of you have heard a lot about these, but some of you haven't, so I'm gonna give you the backdrop. This is a map from 2001. I'll show you an update later. But basically, they're worldwide in distribution from the poles to the tropics. There are areas where they are very concentrated along the coast of Brazil, <coughs> Western Australia, 
throughout Europe and the Mediterranean. But this area I want to talk about now in the Gulf of California on the west coast is where I'll focus this next part. So I talked about locals and what they know and early natives. Well, the historical knowledge of rotoliths in the Gulf, some of it comes from the fish, fishermen. They call them chicharrones, which are fried pig fat because they crunch. And when they get them in their net, if you crunch them up, they sound like chicharrones. So you don't say, where are the rotoliths in Spanish? You say, where are the chicharrones? And they were known as, again, as pearl oyster habitat. And Gaston Vives, who was an early pearl oyster um, aquaculturist, he also, he used them in, as a sub substrate for culturing. This next collect is an overview, part is an overview of really a lot of work that's happened here at Moss Landing by students and then collaborations. But we've described the distribution and taxonomy, their role as a foundation species, the importance to fisheries, their carbonate source or carbonate storage um, aspects, and then conservation. And Rafael Rios Mena was a, a professor at, in La Paz, and he came here and did his master's with Mike Foster on taxonomy. And then he went to Australia to do a PhD with Bill Wilkerling, who's a taxonomist. He described the, the morphological variation in numerous species and described other species throughout the Gulf. To, again, I mentioned chicharrones, if you're looking for them, you, well, you can look for white sandy beaches, but you talk to the fishermen and ask for chicharrones. And this is an island where some of the moss landing classes have, been gone, have gone. You can see them from the air. This is in Bahia Concepcion from a plane uh, aerially, and then even from satellites. And that's something that Charnel Wycliffe, who's a student here, is starting to look at in California. This is a map of the distribution of different beds in the Gulf of California. It's incomplete for the Pacific side, and that's an area of emerging in information where they are. We found some, and I'll tell you about those later also, uh, in Isla Natividad. And my Graham has a publication with Rodolis in it. Graham et al, 2016, including uh, Scott Hamilton. But they are a foundation species, so they're increasingly being um, because their widespread distribution and their high biodiversity, they're included with kelps, rotoliths, and seagrasses as a dominant autotroph around the world. Lots of things live on them, in them, eat uh, the things that are in them. So they support a whole uh, range of associated species. They have high biodiversity. They've also been shown to be a nursery habitat, recruitment site, a refuge from predation, and food sources. Most of these are from the Gulf, but this one is from Catalina, the sheephead, um, is foraging in the beds. They create lots of carbonate sand. Shown, that's our, one of the moss landing uh, classes, camping there on the sand. So they're a carbonate source. They also are carbonate storage when they fossilize in these sometimes 60 meter high deposits. So they've been around for a long time. And they're even considered as part of conservation efforts. This is a paper by Enrique Sala in 2002, looking at fish associations throughout the Gulf of California for MPA uh, designations. And they included rotoliths as one of the habitats. More, uh, so this body of work that came out of Mexico is now um, being extended in Catalina. There aren't as many beds along the coast of California, probably because it's so exposed, but they are on leeward island, leeward uh, bays in the, some of the islands uh, down in the Channel Islands and further south. Paul Tompkins on the right hand side uh, was a student with Mike and I and he described the distribution. And then Scott Gabara looked at the diversity in these damaged habitats. The moorings create really a lot of damage and there's continuing work uh, with Matt Edwards on looking at some of the aspects of both biodiversity and the disturbance. And so that was, in 10 minutes, the a whole body of work on rotolith research, mostly from the Gulf of California. But it has been a collaborative effort that I highlighted in Mexico because it's a lot of Mexicans from different institutions have contributed to this. And Rafael Rios Mena and uh, Gustavo Hernandez Carmona, who came here as a uh, visiting scientist, and Mike Foster and their students have really created um, this body of work. And um, it, in some ways, it was like finding the inner tidal. No one had really worked in it. And you had all these concepts from other systems to apply here. So it's been a really exciting uh, way to work together. 
And rotaliths have made the big time. The Biodiversity and Conservation of the Gulf of California, it was a, a book that came out in 2010. Of the eight species on the cover, five of them are not only macroalgae, but they're rotaliths. So um, <laughs> someone twisted someone's arm on that. And more recently, Rafael Rios Mena um, edited, co-edited a uh, book about the global perspective, so put giving um, Rotolus a worldwide uh, initiation and description. So this body of work started back in 1999, or meeting about it, and this is a group of mostly moss landing, that's Bill Wokerling, for those of you psychologists thinking marine botany in the pink shirt, he would always wear pink because he worked on coral line. And then Mike Foster and Rafael Rios Mena with um, Moss Landing and University of La Paz students. More recently, there have been a number of meetings, and there's going to be a meeting in 2010, I mean, sorry, 2021 in Newfoundland, where Pat Gagnon, who was a visiting scientist who worked on coral and uh, rotaliths as well in Newfoundland, is uh, helping to put that meeting on. He and I have been working on a review paper that's not quite finished, but almost. And I want you just to imagine what this plot looks like, because you are part of this plot, all of you, in this room, to a certain degree. This is uh, some data that Katie, our librarian, helped us put together from 1960 to 2020. And it's a cumulative number of papers in these three different areas on seagrasses, kelp, and rotaliths. I want you to imagine what it looks like. And so, this is what it looks like. And. <laughs> That was quick. But I just want to point out that when Mike Graham first started his master's, and me too, it was right around here. So this is, when you worked on kelp then, this is how many papers you had to read. You guys now have to read this one. And so my point is that rotolith work has been increasing, but there is a lot of literature, and it's, it's unwieldy. And getting input from people that have a broad perspective, which comes from a lot of those reviews, um, I just want to make you feel better, but also I want to notice, you to notice that rotolith work is increasing. This is um, an identification of where the, um, the publications have come out. So this is from all those uh, 600 publications, the locations approximately, and it's, um, you can see there's increasing in the Gulf, a lot of work in Brazil, but there's a lot of work in Europe where they have been identified as an important biodiversity habitat and protected. Okay, well, many of you have heard of beer pigs. <laughs> Do you know what it stands for? It stands for benthic ecology and experimental research in phycology in general. So it's a group of phycologists and um, it started back, the name came from uh, trying to find a phycology lab meeting name and it was really, it was pay pay meeting psychology and you when that one was not a very good name so we changed it um, to the beer pigs well that inspired us for this rotolith work to also um, to come up with a name which is poor Spanish if any of you speak Spanish but Baja California we called it the BCSES which is the Baja California Seashore Ecological Society the motto was reject the doll point oh 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 less than point oh 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 one and there's a logo with a rotolith and maybe a polychaete or maybe a moth larva tequila worm. <laughs> but all joking aside, there's an important thing that happens at the end of the day, which we call tea time, tequila shot. But we try to, <laughs> um, to join, you had to have a cosmic insight into rotoliths. And we continue this on in our field, not the tequila part necessarily, but at the end of the day, going around, with, when you're in the field with a group of people and taking that time to talk about what you saw because you saw something really amazing that I didn't see and then you see it tomorrow because she mentioned it and we call it um, having a cosmic insight or just what's the coolest thing you saw today and we do that a lot in our field courses and it's one of the um, times when you can reflect on natural history in a fun way. Okay, so The term serendipity was in my title. Some people really don't like that term. But um, what I, I, I want to talk now about when you are in the field and you make an observation and you see a pattern and you don't know about it or you're curious about it, you might know enough to know, whoa, that's different. 
or, hey, Mike, I saw this thing over here. And so, um, first of all, part of natural history, I feel like, is first being curious and looking for patterns, then seeing them, and then knowing what to do. What do you do then? You tell people that if it's algae, I'd, I'd ask Mike. If it's a fish, I'd talk to Scott or Giacomo Bernardi. And, but also, I have other tools available to me. But if you're there right then and you see it, like you need to document it somehow. So it's either show your friend so that they see it too, so you're not going crazy, or you take a picture of it, so you document it somehow. And then you find out more about it. And if it's an, a, a productive or avenue of research, then you can pursue it and maybe share it with someone that needs another project. Or um, so part of ob this is about observing and then knowing what to do afterwards. When photographers, when, when old cameras used to, use, used to have to set the f-stop, um, photographers have a term called f8 and b there. So it's an intermediate f-stop so you can get a wide range of pictures and have your camera ready. So being out in the field, having your camera ready, and a manta ray swims by and you can get it, or uh, whatever it is. So, but what I mean is I'm gonna, sometimes you're at the end of a, ooh, I, I blew my entry. Sometimes you're at the end of a transect and it's, you're looking at really boring algal quadrats for 10 days straight. And then you finally, you're towards the end of your transect and you look up and you see things. And then you think, oh my God, where's my buddy? <laughs> you, should I go get my buddy? And fortunately, when I saw that, I didn't see this one. Uh, another student, um, Scott Miller saw it. But Ev, I was on a dive and I looked up and fortunately Evan was right behind me because this does not happen very often down in Mexico. But I want to take a brief moment and talk about four different serendipitous, if you want to call them, events that turned into uh, productive research avenues. One of them was here when I first started in the submarine canyon, um, diving with someone who had gotten in trouble for solo diving because he'd always lose his buddy. And so I was just holding on to his tank valve. At <laughs> A hundred feet with my light in the mud, and this body swam by that was probably this big around. And I almost like shook, him, shook his tank, but he didn't know what I was doing. And so then, fortunately, it swam around again, this huge shark. And fortunately, it had a very diminutive mouth, and it had two dorsal fins very uh, set way back. And we came back, we talked to Greg Kaye, who, and looked in Miller and Lee, and it was a prickly shark. And it turned into a tagging opportunity. Nicole Crane, John Heine, and um, John O'Sullivan from the Monterey Bay Aquarium supported this research to tag and look at tag and recovery uh, of um, prickly sharks. And then Cindy Dawson, who was a student with Rick Starr here, did 15 years later or more um, a tagging and acoustic study and put acoustic tags in them to look at how prickly sharks are using the uh, canyon axis. So there is a lot out there. Um, to, that you can do. So that was one observation. The next one was down in Bahia Concepcion. I was setting out experiments and I was working my way back toward shore and all of a sudden I thought I misnavigated because it was deeper. And it started getting deeper and I checked my compass. I looked around and all the rotoliths were pink and I stuck my hand down to pick them up and it was scalding hot. And there was a hydrothermal vent we, there was a shallow depression with a hydrothermal vent with bubbles coming up. And certainly fishermen probably knew about them, but it turned into a series of papers. Matt Forrest did his master's on uh, it uh, with Jorge Ledesma, who's a geologist at University in Ensenada. And they described these hydrothermal vent communities. Another student here looked at the infauna. So it turned into this whole myriad of uh, research opportunities. On our most recent trip, some of you in this room were, were on this trip to Isla Natividad uh, with the crew in the right-hand corner. We were swimming along in a kelp bed and I saw something I'd never seen before, which were roadless in a kelp bed, Max Justice bed. And so this is a future study that could, uh, here are some in the upper right-hand corner. It's different than the roadless beds that I'm used to, but uh, it is an opportunity that one of the students in Ensenada might be pursuing. And then this last example um, that those of you writing proposals or giving talks or posters, there are a lot of boring titles out there. And one of the WSN uh, 
objectives was to have a title that was interesting, memorable, that depicted your work, but made it more uh, interesting. And so this next story is about my contribution to the WSN title contest. And um, we were in the, gul in the mangroves down in the Gulf of California working on hawksbill turtles that Gita helped uh, work on. And uh, I was swimming along doing these really boring algal transects. And on the bottom, we found a turd. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, my kids had been in a boat above, and I thought, oh my god, I can't believe we saw a turd from one of the kids. I can't believe they, they pooped, and we ended up, on the, of all the places in the lagoon, I ended up seeing it. So now I'm laughing, my buddy swam off, and I'm like, I gotta take a picture, and I get closer and closer, and there's Halamita and Padina, and part of a mangrove shoot sticking out. Jim Harvey knows that when you're studying marine mammals and you're trying to understand what they eat, like, the feces is the gold standard. You, you're like, you stop the boat for whatever you're doing and get the poop, because then you can know what they consume. Well, we, can't, we brought it back to camp. My husband said, you can't do a paper on one. And Jim said the same thing. So we found 12 more. We found, over three years, we found 12 more turds. And, did the, and uh, this title, Logs from the Sea of Cortez. This is what spending time in the car driving to Baja helps you with. Logs from the Sea of Cortez, estimating diet preference from turtle, fortuitous fecal finds. And I have a... Um, this was so exciting that, because um, Dorota gave this talk. I can't put it on because it's my, this mag megaphone. But this, we think this should be on the cover of Science because it's such a nice picture. But, um, and about 10 different people at the meeting when I put that on came up and said we were reselling them. And so Ed Demartini, we, we bought it for him for $100 cheap for this t-shirt. So, but fortuitous fecal finds. So th that's what I mean by seeing something, knowing it's different, taking a picture, observing it, knowing when to collect it, and, and having it turn into something. So it has been um, one of the interesting topics of my life. <laughs> it also developed K through 12 education. My kids actually dissected the poop, which the one on the right, Sage, is plugging her nose with the gloves, <laughs> which you never do. <laughs> She hadn't touched it yet. Okay. <laughs> all right. So all joking aside, I mean, I'm, you guys are biologists and um, oceanographers, and you understand the, immerse, the importance of immersing yourself and natural history. And you guys are also being trained as young scientists to go forward into the future. I'm talking about work I started 25 or 30 years ago. And you guys that are getting your master's, this is the brink of your start launching into it. So what are you gonna do? What's gonna happen fortuitously? What are you gonna take advantage of? Who are you gonna meet and collaborate with? All of those are, talk to all the, pe the amazing people here in this room that have walked that path and find out what paths they have taken. It's the Anthropocene. We, every environment that we go into now has likely been impacted by humans. And there's changing ecosystems, novel relationships, distributional shifts, and species invasions. And there are large data sets out there. And there's a push to work up large data. But that we still need to train the people that are going out and making observations. And that's you guys. So that we pick up on um, these changes. And that understanding does, depends on exploration field observation and taxonomic knowledge. So who do you call when you see something new? Who do you, what do you Google? Not call, that's probably old fashioned. Um, but you, one of the ways we're doing it here, and all the different classes use the amazing facilities we have here and the amazing group we have at Moss Landing to do immersive field classes, whether it's for a day using the boats and going offshore or going down to Baja or what have you. But, um, or making tools like this is the, on the right hand side is the chupador, the suction dredge that they made out of PVC in the field to uh, uh, pick up uh, samples. But training you guys is what we are all still passionate about. And it's easy to not do it now. And I feel like we have to maintain that and you guys have to demand it. This is our, um, in our class in Baja, and I just want you to know, we call it the mother hips, the, dual, the truck with the dualies that's still alive. It's parked there in the bushes. And this is an important person for us. 
Jim Harvey has been instrumental in not only going in the field himself and doing his own work, but also making it continue to happen and be possible to go outside. And so, um, and take all of these trips and try to make things happen. And it's taxing and challenging and getting more so now that we have more distractions, but I really commend all of, of him in particular, but all of the labs here at continuing that. Um, we have old tools like photo quads, but we also have new tools like these CBITS, collapsible benthic chambers. And so there's still the possibility to use old techniques combined with new technology. There's all these old books that some people haven't even, don't even know about anymore because you're using things like this. And so I, my, I'm making a case for use both. You know both because you'll find amazing uh, uh, things in Abbott and Hollenberg, which will, I don't know if it will ever be uh, updated because it's, go anyway, that's a different topic. But um, <laughs> teaching taxonomy and using new tax technologies and collaborating, maintaining these international multidisciplinary and science and non-scientist uh, collaborations is also instrumental. We here at Moss Landing have collaborations like the CCFRP. Um, WSN is, um, well, CCFRP uses both fishermen and scientists and trying to, uh, with non-traditional groups, use them to help us collect data. So meetings, facilitating with technology, through virtual collaborations, Charnel made me learn Zoom. Um, learning how to sh share data, Angela Lizette made me learn Google Drive. <laughs> but I mean, all joking aside, I mean, there's so many possibilities to uh, collaborate, but we still need to have the foundation in that uh, scholarly science, and we do that here at Moss Landing really well. This talk was dedicated to people in, that have passed in this um, picture. The Cuevas family has supported us for over 30 years down on this little island, and these three, Pepe Juan and Chacho Cuevas, were all um, fishermen and grew up on the islands in the 30s and 40s. And I just want, I like this picture. This is a Moss Landing student showing Chacho, who did, she didn't know he couldn't read, but, um, or see. <laughs> but she show, she's showing him the fish book, the fish guide, and asking him if he'd never seen those. So, I mean, these rich collaborations with people that are so widely trained, but are, um, have so much knowledge, but you have to just get it in a different way. Rafael Rios Mena, who is, uh, introduced people to field and phycology, and then Don Canestro, who, um, immersed a lot of people, taught, trained them how to immerse themselves in both science and natural history. Um, so I want to end. Thank you for taking the time today to talk about science and natural history. And I want to focus on the mega charismatic mega flora and change this slightly, which um, nobody sees a rotolith really. It's so small, it takes time. We haven't time, and to see takes time like to have a friend takes time. And so I want to plug just continuing to take the time both in the field and for yourselves uh, to pursue science. Um, that was the end. I just, or the baby, that was for Bennett. He's a new phycologist. So it's people like you that, you know, taking you in the field and, and seeing all of your guys' excitement uh, that is what helps us continue also. So thanks. Oh. The raffle, so I'll take any questions if you want. But I, what I want, I have three more slides. That um, I, it's okay. I there are three books that, if you haven't read them, I highly recommend them. And the raffle is part of the last one, so hold, bear with me. If you ever having a hard time in the field, cold, wet, <laughs> tired, heavy, you should. Everyone should read. Endurance by Ernest Shackleton. If you want to know about California, also endurance, but two years before the mass, written by Richard Henry Dana, why Dana Point is named after, and who first came into San Francisco Bay on a, on a schooner, um, that's an amazing read. But all of us are familiar with Darwin and Darwin's influence on our thinking. Who Darwin was so excited to meet when he was a young scientist was Alexander von Humboldt. And Mike Graham and Joan and Paul Dayton, Joan, um, 
Parker, and they wrote, and Paul Dayton, they wrote this book that's in the library, The Essential Naturalist. And it has excerpts from a lot of the natural, I've been talking about natural history, it has excerpts, some of the highlights of all these natural historians that went all over the world and told their stories. But this guy, and, and he's got one of the great stories in there, this book just came out about him, The in Invention of Nature. Some of us went to Humboldt, have friends that went to Humboldt. This is the Humboldt that we're talking about. That this guy was an amazing German scientist who traveled all over and really, uh, I won't tell you more than that, maybe you wanted to, but um, this book, this is the library's copy, but I am going to do a raffle right now. I'm gonna buy the person that wins this book. And it's called The Invention of Nature. By, uh, by Andrea Wolf, but it's about Alexander von Humboldt. So on that note, did everyone put a paper in the thing? Where is it? I know. Where is it over here? Oh, it's me! So, so if I don't have my name in it, you can do it. Okay. I will. Uh, all right. I need I need a volunteer. Anyone? Okay, AC. Come on, AC. Turn around. And now, uh, all right. You put your hand down here. Oh, oh you want me to hand it to you? Yeah. Oh, it says Mike Graham. <laughs> and the winner is Jake T. All right. Hey. That was amazing. But you guys can all do that for free in the library. Check it out. And I want to show Tom Conley actually did check this out. So that's our oceanographer. That's how cool Moss Landing is. <laughs> Any questions? No questions. Wow. Uh, <laughs> stunned audience. I was wondering, uh, the, oh, man, I forget. Can you go back, like, five slides? <laughs> <laughs> California Sea Grant funding to look at mooring disturbance in the rotolith beds in Catalina. And we were out there last summer and we had someone in the boat. Uh, we, we went to Avalon in the summer. There's huge boats all around us, but we got our mooring. There's a rotolith bed in about uh, 60 feet. And there was a couple arguing on their humongous yacht on the next mooring over. And that should, you should never go diving when people are arguing like that. But he, we went down and they'd started their engines. So we, we made a mistake and we should not have done it. But he ran over, he left while, after we were on our way down and he ran over his uh, whisker pole and it came shooting down <laughs> between us. I mean, it probably wouldn't have hurt us that bad. But Scotty, <laughs> this is Scotty and he had found underwater the whisker pole, and so we give it to the harbor patrol. That's what he's doing, he, but he's investigating with his flashlight and a whisker pole. <laughs> That's what he's doing. Uh, well, so you had another picture even earlier of a whole bunch of different people, and one of them was lying on a bed of white, and was that a rotolith bed, or was that um, this one, Carlos? Oh, yes. So he, um, he looked at, um, they're mostly shells. I think this is up in the northern uh, gulf. But the, he was looking at the faunal, so he's a geologist here at Moss Landing. And on, there are a lot of Pleistocene uplifted deposits of old rotolith beds that have a lot of clams intermixed in them in the geologic deposits. There are also underwater the living rotolith beds with a lot of uh, carbon uh, clams. And so I think this is on one of the carbonate, the beaches with a bunch of clam shells. If you've ever been in the Northern Gulf, there's a lot of, um, what, was the, what was the, I have a bumper sticker in my office from the guy. Make, make bring the dead to life. I don't know. It was a, from Arizona State, the head geologist from the ge geology department was on his committee. And he worked in the Northern Gulf in these big, beds where 
he was looking at historically the temperature using the paleo the signal for temperature in the clams. And so that is I think when he went to the Northern Gulf. But I was not there for that one. That's Carlos Intra. Anything else? Okay. Thanks for joining me.